Happy Hump Day and welcome to this week's episode of the Midweek Mini. I hope your week is going great so far. It is here in my little world. But before we go real deep into today's um, episode, I just want to let you guys know that right now I'm doing a special on fall mini um, photo sessions. Yes, I do photography too. Um, you can get for $25, you can get a 30 minute session and um, that's good until October 29th. Now that includes like the session fee, a thumb drive <clears throat> of your photos. Plus I'll even email those photos to you because i mean i know you gotta upload them to social media and stuff so and you have permission to print i'm not set up yet for print but that is coming soon but you can print any of those from the session now spots are filling up kind of quickly i was a little bit surprised by that but if you want one and you're in the upstate or midlands of south carolina get in touch with me asap okay all right, well, enough of me plugging my side business, um, and let's get on with today's episode. Triple M Studios proudly presents Midweek Minis, and here's your host, Andrea Lee. Alrighty, y'all. I just realized I didn't even tell y'all what we were going to be talking about today, but here we are about to talk about it. Well, just over 36 years ago, one of the worst industrial accidents rocked a city in India, and that city was Bhopal. During that time, the population of Bhopal was between 784,000 and 1 million. The area had went through like this big economic growth but that didn't mean everybody was so lucky to be living the high life about 20 percent of the city's population lived in what they called i think i'm pronouncing this right kacha or kucha homes and those homes were basically like the ghetto they would take whatever they could and build homes out of them and they were temporary um and most of them didn't even have doors from like the pictures that I saw of them but anyway in 1984 the majority of those homes were located in the industrial section of the city one of the major industries there in that area was a chemical plant owned by Union Carbide India and it was probably the largest employer in the area the plant was built in 1969 and at that time the area was going through a period where pesticides seemed to be the end thing as far as the industrial world. So this plant made pesticides. A gas called MIC and it does have a longer name but um, the words that MIC stands for would take me like the rest of the week to pronounce. But um, it was the main ingredient in the pesticides and at first they were shipping that MIC gas from the United States over to India but to make things more cost effective the plant got permission from the city to manufacture that poisonous gas there in India at that plant well a few years after they started producing that gas for themselves things started taking a dangerous turn on Christmas Day in 1981, a leak of one of the ingredients that's used to make the MIC gas killed a worker and sent another one to the hospital. Well, only a month after that, there was another leak that sent 25 people to the hospital. Well, when Union Carbide, um, they sent their own inspectors over to the plant, they found a total of 61 safety violations and apparently they never corrected those violations though now also there had been like some budget cuts and they couldn't afford this eight million dollar computer system that would monitor and prevent leaks from taking place in you know the whole scheme of things there but even without the fancy computer system and 16 
less shut off valves. They had eight, and normally you would have 24. But anyway, even without 16 of those that they needed, um, or what was required for such a plant, things could still run smoothly if things were done correctly, or so they said. Underground there at that plant, there were three tanks for holding the MIC gas, and each of them had a capacity of 60 tons. There were several safety features in place to keep the risk of a dangerous accident from happening, but obviously it wasn't enough. In the early 1980s, India went through this drought, and that meant there was less crops being produced, which in turn meant they didn't need as much pesticide. So more corners and costs were cut at that Union Carbide plant, and a lot of the workers there ended up leaving the plant to find jobs somewhere else. So it ended up that the plant was being ran by just like a skeleton crew. Well, in November of 1984, a flare tower, and what a flare tower does is it burns off like any leaked chemicals. It was taken offline for maintenance, but it was kept offline because that maintenance kept getting shoved to the side. Well, and not only that, but two other fail safes that they had in place there had been taken offline before that. Well, somewhere between 8 and 9 8, p.m. sorry about that 8 and 9 p.m. on December 2nd of 1984 a catastrophic event took place. An order had been given to flush the pipes that leads one of the um, ingredients to the underground MIC tanks but it was unknown to that night's crew that a safety valve that was supposed to prevent water from spilling into the tank had been uninstalled. So Water flowed into MIC tank number 610. Before the water started flowing into that tank, there was already 42 tons of MIC in it. And as I said earlier, these tanks are designed to hold only 60 tons. But for safety reasons, they would only fill them about half full. So that meant it should have been like 30 tons was in it, but it was 12 tons over that. So, it was already pretty full. Well, the water pouring into the tank causes the temperature of the MIC to rise. And remember I said that two other fail-safes had been taken offline before the flare tower? Well, one of those was a refrigeration system designed to cool the tanks. Around 11.30 p.m., workers started saying that they could smell a leak around the tank. And on top of that, they could see this yellowish water coming out of the relief pipe so they decided to activate a water current to neutralize it and then they went on break now they probably didn't realize you know how serious the situation was but while they're taking this break the pressure in the tank continued to rise and so did the temperature in the tank because at some point the temperature was 300 degrees celsius which is around 572 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the crew is realizing just how serious the situation is, so they start doing a series of tasks, you know, to try and remedy the situation, but nothing was working for one reason or another. And it, it was seriously like a, a series of, unaf oh, I can't talk tonight, unfortunate events. Now, around 1 a.m., people that were living around that area they could smell the gas. So um, a supervisor there in the plant, he rang the, their emergency alarm for a few minutes. So that gave the people in the village around it like a heads up to start evacuating the scene. Well, those who hadn't been awoken by the alarm woke up when their eyes started burning from this leak. And not only were their eyes burning, they were having trouble, like these horrible chest pains and they had a really bad cough well soon their throats would swell closed and basically they would just suffocate to death when the police arrived the entire scene was like utter chaos and there was people running everywhere people were literally dropping dead right there in the streets and no age group was spared women men and children of all ages were dead Finally, sometime after 2 a.m., the safety valve, valve was replaced or resealed, and the leak stopped. 
there was literally a cloud of that MIC gas floating over the slums of um, Bhopal. 12,000 people were taken to the hospitals for treatment that first morning, but by the next morning, 55,000 people were being treated. And y'all, that's like more than there are people in our entire county where we live. Now, over the next few days, 170,000 people were being treated for their symptoms from the dangerous gas leak. But now, not all of these people were from the slums. Winds had carried the gas to the south of the city and covered a 12 square mile area. And get this, the healthcare workers in the hospitals that were taking care of the victims, they also suffered some effects of the gas too because they were coming into contact with it from touching the victim and survivor's skin and their clothes. Well, Union Carbide estimated that just within the first few hours of the leak, 3,800 people had died, and not to mention all the animals that were affected by this also. In the first week after the leak, it was estimated that approximately 8,000 people had died. And other people have like higher estimate estimates of you know how many people really died um so 8000 sounds like a lot but they're saying that's not quite close to actually how many people did die and those who hadn't died were left with like vision respiratory reproductive genetic and brain impairments children that were born after the incident they were born with severe birth defects and the problems just kept present, or they keep presenting themselves because in 2019, there was a study done and their pollutants, they still continue to contaminate the groundwater. And then there's like this domino effect because, you know, the groundwater affects so much in the environment. Now, some places around the plant are still so contaminated. And I mean, this has been like 36 years or so. But it's still so contaminated that you can actually lose consciousness from standing there for just a few minutes. And this next statistic blew my mind. But 75% of the COVID-19 deaths in um, Bhopal were actually survivors of that incident back in <coughs> 1984. Sorry about that, y'all. Now, shortly after the disaster... The CEO of Union Carbide, it was a man named Warren Anderson. <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> he visited Bhopal and he was immediately placed on house arrest so that he could be held accountable for what happened with his company. But just a few hours after he was put in jail, he posted bail and he booked it out of India. After that, he was considered a fugitive from justice, and although many extradition attempts were made, he never returned to India, and he retired from that company in 1986, and he never, ever faced any legal consequences. But before he died in 2014, he did say that he had a guilty conscience over it. Now, some justice has been found in an effort to hold someone accountable for this tragedy because in 2010, eight people, including the former plant manager, were found guilty of death by negligence. They were sentenced to just two years in jail and they had to pay a small fine. Union Carbide was ordered to pay over $400 million in damages to the victims, but like once they had filed their claims, that was only like $800 per person. And to this day, activist groups are still trying to seek justice and accountability for those victims. Well, y'all, that's all I have for today's episode. Don't forget to come back on Wednesday. Not Wednesday, because today is Wednesday. Jeez, I'm glad this is... Or y'all going to be glad this is over, because I need to shut up for a little while. Don't forget to come back on Friday... And that's Friday night for a new episode of What the Friday. Thanks for listening, y'all. <laughs>